Hi, welcome to the Careers Unfiltered podcast with Mentoria. You may know your dream job, you may know your dream career, but do you know what goes on behind the scenes in your chosen career path? Have you been able to separate the glamour from the reality in your career? Do you know the good, the bad and the ugly in your career? Most people walk into their careers without having any idea in terms of what really happens in that career, how to crack success, how to get the right job, how to grow in the career. Don't be those people. Get the ins and outs of your career path through some of the best subject matter experts and industry professionals that Mentoria will bring to you on the Careers Unfiltered podcast. The latest generation of uh, fighter aircraft are there on the Indian Air Force's inventory. And should you join the Air Force as an aerospace medicine specialist, these are, are the times which will really be inspiring and uh, challenging and rewarding at the same time. A large number of years that I spent with the squadrons in various stations uh, of the Indian Air Force. And that really is where the field practice of my specialty, aerospace medicine, takes place. When uh, a specialist gets posted as a squadron medical officer, uh, as a squadron specialist uh, uh, to a fighter squadron, that uh, really is uh, where we work and, and in close uh, contact with our fighter pilots and other pilots and other uh, supporting staff, including fighter controllers, air traffic controllers, and the whole gamut of people who are involved in making uh, military aviation what it is. Yes. So, yeah. <clears throat> so, I, I want to share with you that this speciality, aerospace medicine, it exists to promote safety in the air. The, the raison d'etre or the, or the real reason for our existence as aerospace medicine specialists is in whatever we do uh, to improve and enhance human performance uh, so that safety in the skies is improved. That is the basis of the speciality. So whether it is to select pilots who are medically fit whether it is to look after the pilots who are fit and they need to be uh, performing in the challenging environment of aviation and space and how to make them uh, function even better. Uh, and then when they go through diseases and disabilities or injuries, when and how to get them back to the cockpit and uh, make them fly safe again. Uh, this time with or without limitations. If there are limitations to be imposed, then we have to decide why we are doing those and why uh, to ensure safety uh, and putting back a person back into the cockpit uh, can be uh, with some limitations. So this uh, is broadly what the speciality does. But I also want to add that uh, we contribute largely also to design of aircraft. So whether it is the light combat aircraft, the Tejas, which is flying or the advanced light helicopter, which are being, which were designed in house in the country, uh, our specialists from the human engineering department of the Institute, uh, give a lot of inputs in evolving the safe environs of the cockpit. So whether it is the design of the cockpit, the, the design of the cockpit layout, and how safely a person can escape from an aircraft in an ejection scenario. All these things are built into uh, the design of an aircraft. And, and we as specialists, aerospace medicine specialists, meaningfully contribute to this part of aviation safety as well. And last but not the least is uh, space. Uh, so when we signed uh, an MOU with the ISRO, the Indian Space Research Organization, we took it upon ourselves uh, to not just select uh, astronauts who are fit, but also the human factors involved in the space module where they'll be going into uh, a space and then getting recovered, what all it entails. The entire gamut of uh, space safety also becomes our domain. 
So I hope I've given you a broad overview of what the speciality is. So the way to become an aerospace medicine specialist is first to become a medical doctor. And uh, after class 10, you have to choose uh, science with biology. Uh, and once you've accomplished your class 12, then you have to write in India the NEET exam, the NWET, to get into a medical college and complete your basic uh, MBBS degree, the Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery. And once you've acquired MBBS, uh, then you apply through NEET again uh, to get into the only institute in our country which offers MD Aerospace Medicine, which is the Institute of Aerospace Medicine at Bangalore, which is uh, an Indian Air Force establishment. But we train uh, not just uh, doctors from the military, we encourage uh, civilian doctors to also join the MD program. And every year, if I remember right, there are at least three seats uh, for civilian doctors. So that's the way to become an aerospace medicine specialist. The MD degree makes it a speciality. See, MBBS is the basic degree for all doctors. And after MBBS, you either get into the surgical side where the degrees are called MS, Master of Surgery, or you get into the MD side, which is the Doctor of Medicine. And aviation medicine or aerospace medicine, you earn an MD in aerospace medicine from the Rajiv Gandhi University of Health Sciences, which is the Health University of Karnataka, to which is affiliated our institute, the Institute of Aerospace Medicine. And like I said earlier, you have, in order to become a specialist in aerospace medicine, you need to earn this MD degree, which is available through the route I told you, uh, to through the need get into IAM or the Institute of Aerospace Medicine, pursue a three-year degree program, MD course at the Institute and pass out as an MD Aerospace Medicine Specialist and then either choose to serve the armed forces or serve in the civilian uh, setup. I'd like to share with you uh, what was a typical day in my life when I was posted to a squad. Because that is the interesting part. Now I'm uh, a consultant and I'm doing a very different kind of a role. But a typical day in the life of an aviation medicine specialist or an aerospace medicine specialist is in a, is an Air Force station. And you know, uh, when he's uh, posted as a squadron medical officer after having done his speciality. So I would imagine a typical day would begin at uh, something like 5 a.m. in the morning where uh, I used to be up and about and, and uh, get ready to attend a, a morning briefing uh, for the pilots in the squadrons or in the base ops where a large number of pilots are there who are being briefed about the met conditions, the air traffic, uh, that particular day the service is available. And we are sitting there and we spend some time with each of those uh, fighter pilots to help them decide that they are medically and physically fit to fly that day. So that's how the day begins typically in an Air Force station for the AVMED specialist. He attends the morning briefing, sometimes one, two, three briefings depending on what is the situation. So I remember when, when the Cargill Ops were going on and I was the squadron doctor in an Air Force station up uh, north in India. Uh, Flying used to start sometimes at 4 or 4.30 in the morning and you had to be there before that. But th those were such exciting times. Our, our guys were going and bombing and photographing uh, those, uh, you know, park intruders on the Cargill Heights and, and, and the whole station was abuzz. There was, there was so much activity going on. There are operational readiness platforms where you had to go and see uh, the pilots who are on five minutes or two minutes standby to take to the skies. and. Everyone is charged and that, that's how uh, a young uh, doctor starts his day uh, typically in the fighter station. After this part is done, uh, the briefings, then he comes back to what is called the station Medicare center uh, where he conducts what we call the sick report. So uh, among the serving personnel, uh, those who are reporting uh, sick for whatever reason are examined and, and then treatment is started or either they are admitted or sent back to unit with some medicine to perform their duties. 
and then that gets over and then the day goes on with the medical exams and medical boards and looking after patients who are admitted in your wards and all this happening while you are also attending to medical emergencies or, or, or flying emergencies so you get a call uh, from the air traffic controller there's an aircraft which is uh, having some kind of an emergency and is is trying to uh, come in for an emergency landing so you get into the ambulance and rush to the air traffic control tower and wait for uh, things to happen after that in case you find that there's been an accident or an incident off base you quickly get uh, uh, airlifted in a helicopter and reach the site of where uh, you know the happening has occurred and then you come to the rescue of the pilot and sometimes uh, you have to bring him back in a helicopter so this is the kind of a situation which develops every day and then you pack up for the day maybe at around 2:30 uh, or uh, there about in the afternoon but if you are the duty medical officer then you are again on uh, on a walkie talkie while flying is on to attend to such emergencies all the time uh, the duty medical assistant can call you to the uh, medicare center to attend to any medical or surgical emergencies which might come so all in all uh, you know once or twice in a week when you do such duties you are from the morning till sometimes through the night till the next day you are on the ball and things are happening in the station and you are you know responding to them so it's exciting times uh, i've given you a typical day in the life of uh, what i remember uh, as an avmed specialist and i'm sure youngsters are still enjoying this kind of a scenario you are committing yourself to the nation so i mean there will be eventualities when you are called at short notice uh, to move from place a to place b by land sea or air that's a part of your charter and you cannot say no so uh, permanent postings and moving frequently on permanent postings is definitely a challenge it applies to your families uh, your children keep changing schools every now and then but in the larger scheme of things uh, these challenges can actually be opportunities because i find that uh, foggy children uh, are because of this perhaps uh, more adaptable and and more uh, accustomed to uh, change as they uh, go through their various careers later in life uh, having said that uh, sometimes uh, you know moving uh, at short notice or moving to places which are poorly connected by air or rail or road can be uh, quite a demanding thing uh, and the other thing is uh, temporary duties so in the air force typically uh, for a medical officer or an aerospace aerospace medicine specialist uh, you will be asked to uh, move at short notice uh, to another station for maybe a month or sometimes uh, more or less uh to look after duties at some other station leaving your family behind so these you have to accept so whether you know you in the thick of winters i went on a temporary duty to air force station dalhousy which was full fully covered with snow and uh, yeah i mean it was a challenge but i learned skiing <laughs> so <laughs> so yeah, you can always you know find different things to do in various different places and i have enjoyed all my temporary duties although some people do consider them challenging but yeah uh, this specialty is not the typical medical or surgical specialty so one it is not a hospital based specialty so you've got to understand that the large part of the practice of this specialty is a kind of occupational medicine you're looking after a niche segment the air crew and the support crew and their families this is what is your segment and uh, your attention in helping them to perform their duties better and to overcome minor diseases disabilities or sometimes even major diseases disabilities to get back the cock that is the mainstay of your specialty so uh, some doctors may find it you know very different from the other medical or surgical specialty so that is uh, that you have to understand is 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 very distinct and the other thing is that some of our specialists in other fields consider that 
aerospace medicine is too horizontal a specialty. That means, you know, a little bit of eye, ENT, psychiatry, medicine, surgery, orthopedics, everything. So it's a khichdi. Uh, but yeah, take it how it is. But uh, I mean, you, you got to accept this, understand this and then take to it. Uh, yeah, adaptability definitely, but uh, more than that, uh, uh, an inquisitiveness to learn something new and to get into fields which are quite unexplored. If you have a mindset like that, then it definitely helps you. If you have a little skill or a, a knowledge base, which is uh, more a little into physics and mathematics, uh, then it helps you. Uh, normally not uh, of use for other doctors or other specialties but here it is a it's important so if you are inclined towards that it help, definitely helps you perform better so these to my mind and of course uh, uh, a willingness to learn a willingness to be a good uh, follower and then when the time comes uh, to be a good leader Yeah, you're talking to someone who's a little biased <laughs> towards the armed forces. So, you know, um, in my early days in the uh, Air Force, we are all entitled for 60 days of annual leave, 6-0. And there have been many years when I've taken 50 to 59 days of annual leaves with my family and been to places, uh, been home with parents or whatever. So there's enough and, and plus 20 days of casual leave. So there's enough leave available, enough opportunities available uh, for you to strike a great work-life balance. All Air Force stations or military stations have good sports facilities. Sports and uh, physical training is an in integral part of the armed forces. So the opportunity to maintain a healthy, balanced uh, lifestyle and to have great social bonding. I mean, uh, with the squadrons with whom I have served, I am still uh, great friends with. So, I mean, this is something which, uh, which, which cannot perhaps be replicated. And I, I would like to believe that uh, for a good work-life balance, nothing like the armed forces. Uh, women are doing exceedingly well in my speciality. Uh, one of my teachers uh, is uh, Air Marshal Padma Bandhopadhyay. She uh, has been the Director General of the Medical Services of the Air Force. And she has uh, been on the Antarctica tour as uh, an AVMED specialist. So she, she has uh, performed brilliantly through her career and risen to the topmost position in the Air Force. Uh, similarly, there are uh, ladies uh, specialists who have who have really excelled. I mean, several names come to my mind and I don't want to share uh, all of them and lest I miss out on some uh, dear friends who feel offended later. But I, what I'm, all I can uh, tell you is that uh, ladies are performing exceptionally well and they are shoulder to shoulder with the men. Uh, you know, we were talking about pulling high G's on the human centrifuge, which is one of the great simulators that we have in our institute. There are ladies who have pulled 9G for 5 seconds, just like uh, the male fighter pilots. So, yeah, you, you can't uh, say that, uh, you know, they are not capable of any uh, thing less than the males. No, no, they're, they're just right up there. All glass ceilings have been broken and sky is not the limit.